Well, hey, if you uh, didn't turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 9, go ahead and do that. If you didn't bring a Bible, that's okay. You can actually open up your uh, bulletin right here in your notes. We have the teaching notes. We'll also have the scriptures on the screen. We are studying through the gospel of Mark. If you're new to our church, we're going chapter by chapter, verse by verse. It's not really a sermon series. It's just a book of the Bible. And uh, as you can tell from your notes, we're in session 27, and we are studying Mark chapter 9, verse 1 through 13. My message is entitled, A Mountaintop Experience, very appropriate for Washingtonians. Would you pray with me as we open up the Word today? Father, we thank You for Your Word, and we agree with the psalmist again that it is a lamp to our feet, and it is a light to our path. And we just say in Your presence here now, we need Your Word We need your word. And so we ask, Lord, that you would illuminate the scripture to us as we read it. Holy Spirit, would you be our teacher? Guide us into all truth. We thank you for your presence here. We also ask for the grace to obey the things that you tell us and what your word says to us. Give us the grace to obey you. We are not people that just read. We are people that want to obey. So, Father, help us to do just that. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Well, by way of review, last week we wrapped up Mark chapter 8, and this was where Jesus took his disciples 25 miles north to Caesarea Philippi, and I mean 25 miles north from the Sea of Galilee. And this is where he speaks plainly to his disciples about three things. And these were my points, but it was very clear from the text. He first talks to them about his person, he reveals who he is specifically, very clearly, puts a stake in the ground. I am the Messiah. Peter declared it You are the Christ the son of the living God. And then he reveals to them his plan. And this was not something they were excited about. He told them, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to be killed. And then I'm going to rise from the dead. They went from being excited that he's the guy, that he's the Messiah, to not being so excited because this is not something that they got. And they did not know why Jesus was saying that this was the plan of salvation for the Messiah. And then thirdly, he talked about his pattern. And he was essentially saying to them, if you desire to follow after me, you need to first deny yourself, pick up your cross, the instrument of death, and follow me. You need to be willing to suffer because if you want to see glory, suffering always precedes glory. And what's interesting about what we studied and what we're studying today is that this passage flows right out of the conversation that we were in last week. And we need to know that as we set ourselves to read it. And so... With that said, and with your attention very piqued, let's go ahead and read Mark chapter 9, the first 13 verses. And the Bible says, And Jesus was saying to them, Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Now, just for a second, you have to remember that he's still in the same conversation that we studied last week when he said that. So that's why it's important. Some people actually take verse 1 of chapter 9 and put it into chapter 8. Chapter divisions did not come along until about 1550, and so it was all just a sea of text. So somebody had to decide where this went. Most people believe it should be in chapter 8. So I just want to mention that. Verse 2, six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, And he brought them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured, or he was transformed, or changed before them. His garments became radiant and exceedingly white, as no launderer on earth could whiten them. Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to answer, for they became terrified." And then a cloud formed, overshadowing them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son, listen to him. All at once they looked around and saw no one with them anymore except Jesus alone. As they were coming down from the mountain, he gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man rose from the dead. They seized upon that statement, discussing with one another what rising from the dead meant, meaning they had no clue still. They asked him, saying, Why is it that the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he said to them, Elijah does come first and restore all things. And yet, how is it written of the Son of Man that he will suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah has indeed come, and they did to him whatever they wished, just as it is written of him. 
Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Very quickly, I want to let you know that you know, normally, if, if you're in church for any length of time, or if you're a preacher, a teacher, or Bible study leader, this is not a verse or a set of passages that anybody picks to preach from. Like, if you're randomly going to just speak a message, you're not going to pick the transfiguration experience. It's not going to happen. And so don't you love, as we go through books of the Bible, we have to deal with texts that you normally gloss over. And I want to say this to you as well. When you read this text as a devotion, I guarantee that you and I are missing things. I guarantee it. Unless you go deep into what is being said here and what it means, there's no way that you can come up with what is meant. And this is thoroughly Jewish. We have to reach back into the Old Testament quite a bit to understand the text here today. And so there's a lot of things that we need to know um, that may not be practical in its application, but it is very important if we're going to understand the other chapters that we're studying in the book of Mark. And it's important because, I, I mean, I titled this message a mountaintop experience because that's actually what you see. They go up on a mountaintop. And I'm not sure if you've ever heard this expression or this phrase before, but like when we say things like, God wants to give a mountaintop experience. And sometimes people will say, God doesn't want to just give you a mountaintop experience. Has anybody heard, ever heard this phrase before, Mount in church, mountaintop, half of you? The rest of you, like, I don't even want to raise my hand and tell you so many times. <laughs> the first time I ever heard this phrase, this term, I was at a men's retreat. I was 20 years old. It was my first men's retreat at that, at that time. I didn't even know what a men's retreat was. It was kind of an odd thing to go on a men's retreat, just being from where I'm from. And so I went on this thing, and the, the preacher gets up, and he starts talking about how this week is going to be dynamic and transformational. And then he backs up, and he goes, but I want you guys to know God wants to meet with us every day. He doesn't want us to just have a mountaintop experience and go from one mountaintop experience to another. Now, I didn't know what this guy was talking about. I'm like, what do you mean mountaintop experience? Like, I have no Christianese in me at that point, you know? I didn't know the Christianology. I didn't understand the terminology that he was using. He's like, God wants to give you more than a mountaintop experience. I just want you guys to know, like, sometimes when we use Christianese, like, other people don't know what we're talking about. I was that guy at 20 years old. I was like, yeah, I don't want to climb a mountain. I'm not a hiker, you know? Is that what I came to? Is that what a men's retreat is? What is this guy talking about? So... Anyways, this is therapeutic. I'm just getting out some of my feelings. <laughs> but like many of you, you know, I've come to understand this idea of a mountaintop experience is derived from a biblical perspective. As you study the scriptures, you learn that mountaintops occupy a special place in scripture for a lot of different reasons. Sometimes people will say, because you're closer to God, you're closer, closer to the heavens, there's a lot of scriptures that talk about an experience with God that happened on a mountain. We often read in the Old Testament where people would worship God on the high places. Those were the places where they would go up onto a mountaintop and they would build some kind of altar. And God was angry in the Old Testament when they would build an altar to a pagan God and worship in the high places. And so you'll constantly see people tearing down the high places that were built up to worship pagan gods. But there's a ton of references to mountaintops. I'm just going to bring up a few of them. They should be on the screen. In Genesis 22, we read about Mount Moriah. This is where Abraham was going to offer Isaac as a sacrifice to God. Exodus 19, we read about Mount Sinai. This is where God gave his law to Moses to bring to the people of Israel. 1 Kings 18, this is Mount Carmel. Some of us have been there if you've ever been to Israel. This is where God demonstrated his power through Elijah before all of Israel. 1 Kings 19, this is Mount Horeb. This is where God confronted and ministered to the prophet Elijah because he was sulking in self-pity. Matthew chapter 5 through 7, this is the Mount of Beatitudes. It's really a, a plateau, Chorazim Plateau. It's, it's more of a hill. In Jerusalem, you find more hills than you do mountains, but outside of Jerusalem, you find some, some actual mountains. But that's where Jesus taught his famous sermon, of which we all know something about. John 19, we know Mount Calvary or Golgotha. This is where Jesus Christ was crucified for you and for me for the forgiveness of our sins. Acts chapter 1 and verse 9, the Mount of Olives. This is where Jesus ascended during, during his final conversation with his disciples. And then we're reading today, Mark chapter 9, verse 1 through 13. This is Mount Hermon. If you look it up today, it's Mount Tabor, or that's the way I'm saying it. And this is where Jesus was 
transfigured before them, transformed, changed. And what we know, I'm just referencing all of these um, places because in the Bible, you'll read valleys and mountaintops. Valleys typically reference a place of suffering or difficulty. This is in the valley. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And then mountaintops often reference this place of powerful encounters with God. And I think maybe that's the ebb and flow of spiritual life. That's probably normal. We should want mountaintop experiences. We just shouldn't think that's all God wants to do. We have valleys and we have mountaintops, and God's with us in all of them. He gives us grace for the valleys. He gives us grace and empowerment for the mountaintops. Amen. We want all of them. We want everything that God wants to do. But in this passage today, we read how Jesus takes three of his disciples up on the mountain where they have a mountaintop experience that is unforgettable. It's a historical event. And I want to talk to you about three different aspects of this. And the first is we'll just talk about the mountaintop transfiguration of Jesus. We'll zero in on the transfiguration and what actually happened. How did the disciples see this? How can we see this as we read it here in Mark chapter 9, verse 1? Here's what it says real quickly. Jesus was saying to them, Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, brought them up on a high mountain by themselves. He was transfigured before them. His garments became radiant, exceedingly white, as no launderer on earth can whiten them. Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Let me give you a couple quick points before we go into the things here. After Jesus, again, revealed his person, his plan, his pattern, he says this to them, some of you standing here, these are all the disciples, some of you standing here will not taste death until you see the kingdom of God come with power. Now, I'm bringing this up because people debate over what this means. Some will fold it into their eschatology, and others will believe more of the simple reading or simple rendering of this. I would agree with the simple rendering of this. I think what Jesus simply meant was that some of you who are standing here, Peter, James, and John, will not taste death until you see the kingdom of God coming with power. He took them up on the mountain. He revealed to them who he really was. They saw him. They saw his power. They saw his glory. And I believe that's what Jesus meant. I think it's simple. People often reference Peter, James, and John. Why Peter, James, and John? Did you know there's a lot of teachings referenced to the circles of Jesus Jesus had the crowds, Jesus had the 12, Jesus had the three. We make a lot of really weird teachings that I don't think are intended at all just from those types of things. I don't really know why Peter, James, and John were the ones that he took with them. I I can't answer that. I never talked to Jesus personally about it, and the scriptures don't say. They just show us what happened. They don't tell us why it happened. Why did he choose them? I don't know. I personally think, this is uh, the BIV, this is what I think personally, I think he brought them up because they were going to later testify. And we read in John uh, chapter 1, we also read in 2 Peter chapter 1, where they did actually write about this experience, just as Jesus told them to after his resurrection. So perhaps it was because of the witness that they would be. But when you think about three people, when Jesus brings three people into an experience, he's actually following the law. Deuteronomy 19.15 says that every testimony is to be established by two or three witnesses. And so when John wrote about the glory that he saw on the mountain, or when Peter wrote about what they saw as eyewitnesses in this account, they could, be, they could establish this by two or three witnesses. It wasn't just one person, but several of them saw it. And so I think part of it too is just that. And the interpretation that I've come to on this is simple. I think it's Jesus's MO. He reveals to them in part while he was here in his first coming, and he's going to manifest that in fullness with his second coming. That's, that's how he works constantly. We see that throughout the book of, of Mark. But there's another piece of information you got to get, and this one might be new to you. But this entire experience, when Jesus takes them up on the mountain and he reveals to them his glory, friends, this was not a literal encounter. This was a vision. Everybody say vision. If you don't know that, you're going to follow along some bad eschatology where people start to talk about how Moses' body was disputed and God had to kill him. And they talk about how Elijah was taken up in chariots of fire and he's kind of somewhere in this ethereal world. And then he shows up on the mountain because his body's floating. Listen, you're going to find some weird teaching out there, 
But this is a vision. Do you know why? Because the Bible actually tells us this same account is in Matthew, Luke, and Mark. And it gives us some other details that we need to know when we read this. In Luke chapter 9, it tells us that when they get up on the mountain, they basically fall asleep. It says that the disciples are sleepy. So if you, if you can picture them on the ground kind of fading, which they've done before and they do again, and as they sort of awake out of this sleep that they're in, they see this glorious thing before them. And the other part where we know this is a vision is Matthew 17, 9. When they're coming down the mountain, Jesus tells them, do not tell anybody about the vision that you saw. The word vision is harama. This is a word that only is used for a spiritual vision. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, Acts 9, 10, 11, 12, 16, and 18 tell us. Every time this Greek word is used, it is a reference to a supernatural vision. Like when Peter had a vision in Acts chapter, uh, chapter 10. When Cornelius had a vision in Acts chapter 10. In Acts 16, Paul has a vision of a, mas- a man from Macedonia who says, come over here. It's a vision. Same word is used when Jesus says, don't tell anyone about this vision that you saw. This was not literal. This was a vision. It's very important to know that Moses literally, physically, did not show up in the way that sometimes people teach. Neither did Elijah. It was a vision of Jesus' glory and these two people coming. Was it real? It was very real. In the spiritual realm, the supernatural realm, there are things that happen that you and I cannot explain. But that is exactly what took place, and we know that. And sometimes we get into trouble, and we have bad theology because we don't read all of the accounts. So I highly encourage you to, uh, to do that when you get home. Amen. Okay, I know you, some of you are not so convinced, so you're going to go home and take a look. <laughs> Knowing this, let me share with you a couple things that happened here on the mountain. The first, the glory of Jesus was revealed. Look at verse 2. It says, Jesus was transfigured. This original word relates to what the, the term that we might use, metamorphosis. It's where we see the caterpillar turn into a butterfly. It's the same type of concept. There's a change that happens on the outside, but it's coming from what is already true on the inside. So what happens here is for a brief moment, the disciples saw who and what Jesus really was. But I want to say to you that the real transfiguration did not happen on the mountain. It happened in the manger. Jesus had been restraining his glory, and they got to peer into who he actually was. So it looks that Jesus transfigured, but in reality, he revealed, this is what I really am. dun da da dun This is who Jesus really is. And they saw it. They had been walking with a human being who they knew something was special, and now they knew that he was the Messiah. But he, for the first time, reveals, this is who I really am. And Jesus had to live 33 years restraining the glory with which he truly has. Didn't, he didn't change into something that like he never was. He just revealed what he always was. Amen. The real transfiguration was at the incarnation. Matthew's gospel tells us that the description that Jesus' face was shining like the sun. I just think that's really cool. John tells us in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 16 that when he saw the glorified Christ, that his face was shining like the sun. Friends, I want to tell you, this is not a fictional story. You're going to see Jesus' face shine like the sun. I mean, I know we're reading this today, but you know, don't yawn right now. You're going to see Jesus and you're like, oh, it was real. Yeah, yeah, it was real. Pastor Ben told you this is real. His face was shining like the sun. Moses experienced this in Exodus chapter 34, that when he came into the presence of God, the Shekinah, the glory of God, it says that his face started to shine. There's something about being in the glory of the presence of God that you'll just never stay the same. You just cannot stay the same. His garments became radiant, exceedingly white. No launderer can whiten them. What a funny little detail. It's like no person could bleach them to look like this. I just think that's kind of funny, and people have a lot of studies on that. It it just means it's not natural, people. That's all it means. (laughs) There's no need to do a Greek word study here. It just means that nobody could do this naturally, that this was supernatural. In the Bible, light is used to describe the glory of God. In the Old Testament, we call it the Shekinah, the glory. And we're talking about His essence. We're not defining God's glory by light, but we're saying light emanates from God. 
The Bible says it at least two times in the New Testament. God is light. In him there is no darkness. There's no variation of shadow. Light emanates from him. When people see his glory, one of the ways they describe it is light. It's an incomprehensible it's a light that you cannot contain or you cannot fully receive. People can't fully uh, grasp or see or, or capture what God is. No, nobody really could see his fullness. He's always had to sort of, uh, in a sense, veil himself. But this is what emanates from God. One of the things, though, that's important to see how Jesus revealed his glory in Psalm 104 and verse 1, look what it says, "'O Lord my God, you are very great.'" You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment. This is always talking about Yahweh. Why am I bringing that up? Because every time Jesus says or shows something like this that you can see referenced in the Old Testament, there is no way you can walk away from this and not believe that Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is God the Son. That is a fact. You just wouldn't, if you were a Jewish person, you wouldn't walk away thinking anything else. These references are too clear and they're too close. The second thing that happens here on the mountain is Elijah and Moses appeared. Now, I already told you that it was a vision, but they saw him like it was, they saw them like it was real. We know that Moses represents the law. We know Elijah was the preeminent prophet throughout the Bible. And this is important because Matthew 5, 17 tells us that Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. And now he's sitting here talking with them. What are they talking about though? Well, Luke tells us in verse 31 of chapter 9, they were discussing Jesus's departure. Uh, That word literally means exodus, Jesus's departure as he heads towards Jerusalem. The prophets and the law all point to the Messiah coming that he would give his life. They didn't fully understand. They longed to look into what that meant. And here are Elijah and Moses And this is a powerful picture of the culmination of the Old Covenant and a revelation of Jesus at the same time. The third thing we see is a cloud of God's presence overshadows them. In verse 7, it says, suddenly a cloud formed. And this was no ordinary cloud. This was not like a cloud that we see. And clouds are beautiful. Amen. We see them sometimes in the Northwest. (laughs) We see other kinds of clouds that we want to rain, rain, go away. (laughs) We like the white clouds. But We see these clouds are not a normal type of weather pattern of any kind. These are the manifestation of God's glory. So we see light, and we also see in the Old Testament the cloud of God's glory. In Exodus 16, we read about a cloud by day. The Israelites followed God's glory as as a cloud. In Exodus 40, there was a cloud that would cover the tent of meeting when Moses went in. And all Israel saw this. This was something they they saw. Can you imagine being a child growing up, seeing the cloud of God's glory over the tent of meeting? I mean, if you're like 10 or 11 years old, I bet you people would just stand in reverence watching God's glory just overshadow the temple. It'd be an amazing thing. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 9, you might not know this one or remember it, but there was a cloud that took Jesus or enveloped him as he ascended into the heavens. It was a cloud. Matthew 26 says that Jesus is going to return on clouds of glory with his holy angels. Do you guys see all these references to clouds? It's not talking about these cool clouds in the sky that we think of. It's the glory of God, this revelation of God's glory. If you're Jewish, you would have known that. When they saw the cloud envelop Jesus, they all would have understood what it meant. This is no small thing. It was confirmation. It was a revelation. It was like participating in ancient stories. The disciples were overwhelmed. And the last thing they saw here was a voice from heaven spoke out of the cloud as it enveloped him. And the voice said, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Now, this is significant for a couple reasons. Number one, it was a correction to Peter. Peter's response to all this was essentially like, hey, let's build some tabernacles and stay here. And the cloud comes and the voice of God speaks and says, this is my beloved son. And I bet you it would have just stopped Peter. Like, okay, okay, okay. Would have been a lot more than that, I'm sure. But it's a correction to Peter's response. Second, it's an affirmation from the father of a messianic prophecy in the Old Testament. You may know this prophecy from Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 
15 because it's referenced in the book of Acts later in response to Jesus after He's risen from the dead and ascended. But this is what the prophecy was. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me among you from your brothers, and it is Him, to Him you shall listen. This was a messianic prophecy. This was not a word on how to deal with prophets. This was about, Moses was a type and a shadow of that which was to come. He was a a mediator of a covenant. He was the bringer of the law. Jesus now was going to be the mediator of the new covenant. And so when Moses is the one that says this prophecy, the disciples understood the prophecy, but Jesus fulfilled the prophecy all there on the mountain. It's a pretty incredible prophecy. Uh, thing. The point here is that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is greater than Moses. Obey the Son. Listen to Him. Amen. That's what we can pull away with that. What's the application? Listen to Jesus. He's the guy. Well, how did they respond to all this? I want to just talk a little bit about the mountaintop response of the disciples. Kind of a funny illustration. I probably shouldn't bring it up, but I'm going to because I have the microphone and I made a choice to do it, but uh, have you guys ever seen the show called Undercover Boss? It's super weird. Like, it's, <laughs> it's really staged, I know. I, I think it started off not staged, but now they stage it because they can never predict what people are going to say and do. It's like all of us. We want to control things because we don't. Anyways, all right. So they, what happens in the show is basically it'd be like the CEO of Starbucks. He goes to work at one of the stores. And he's basically a, a barista or a baristo or whatever you call the male version of that, or if it's a gal, it doesn't matter. Anyhow, so he works as a, a barista and uh, he's getting to know all the people and it's kind of emotionally sappy because Johnny talks about his cat and uh, Sarah talks about how her car broke down and somebody talks about how they can affo- can't afford college. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it, they're just trying to pull on all the emotional strings as much as possible because that's what sells. And so it's like, he's just, oh, really? That's what's going on in your life? And so <laughs> he's just like wearing the apron and maybe a mask. I don't, I don't know what he's wearing. He's wearing like some kind of thing to disguise himself or they don't know who he is or she could be a sheep. And, uh, and then at the end, all of a sudden, the show's like, duh, 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 duh. I'm actually the CEO of the whole company. And Sarah, you're going to get that car. And we're going to buy something for your fluffy at home. And he just, you know, everybody gets a car. It's just a kind of a funny, kind of a funny end. You know, they never talk about the guy that like didn't like the CEO and he gets fired. But anyhow, <laughs> you know, that's got to happen too. Come on, that's got <laughs> Not everybody's just all sappy and like, here's what's going on in my life, and I'm such a good employee. It's like, come on, real world. We should have real world undercover boss. (laughs) That would be the one I would watch. Anyways, but this is like, to me, this story is like real undercover boss. Like, here's Jesus, like, boom, this is who I really am. And they're like, ah, we thought so, but now we know for sure. I I just, I don't know. Anyways, you want to go home and watch Undercover Boss. I know it. Three things. When we look at the disciples' response, number one, the disciples wanted to prolong the experience. Verse five, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Peter's literally standing in glory. He's seeing Moses and Elijah, and he's like, it is good for us to be here. Let me make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. That's a great idea. I mean, if you didn't think Peter was impulsive, you got to think he's impulsive now. He's just saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. And yeah, I, I, I know the teaching. Peter's probably reflecting on the Feast of Tabernacles, and this is where Israel would stay in tents outside of their home, and it would point to their final deliverance, and he wanted to build these tents for Jesus but it's an odd response to the new glory and revelation that he has. It, it, it might be the best he's got, but it's just kind of strange. He's trying to prolong the experience. But can I just tell you that sometimes we, aren't, we don't have an experience like this. This was an event of which will never occur again. But the experience that we read about in there, he does many other times throughout the Bible. And God still gives experiences to people today. The event will never repeat itself, but the experiences, will we ever have a revelation of God's glory? Will will we ever hear His voice? Of course we do. Absolutely. This room is full of people who have encountered His glory, heard His voice. So the experience we still have. Sometimes when we experience God, He wants us just to listen to the psalmist, Psalm 4610, I think it is, be still and know that I'm God. This is not a time for you to do this. This is the time for you to do this. (laughs) Peter's not doing that. 
And sometimes I think we can do the same thing and we miss what the experience is for. And you don't want to miss what the experience is for. This is an incredible, historical, powerful moment. I know it's hard for us sometimes to look back and see it that way, but it is. And they're standing in the middle of it. We just want to set up shop. Let's build some houses. And I think we need to see it for what it is. They're prolonging the experience. You can't. You need to glean from the experience what God has and really humble yourself. The second thing is the disciples were afraid by what they experienced. At the same time, Peter speaks up. The scriptures tell us that they were scared. It specifically says they were afraid and did not know how to answer. But then Peter does anyways. (laughs) They were afraid and they did not know how to answer. But Peter, out of that, he just, blah. And I just want to tell you, like, Sometimes the Lord wants to come in powerful ways in in our life. Again, I'm I'm not trying to diminish the historical reality of this story, but just to sort of jump out of that for a minute and talk about us, we've got to learn that the fear of God is something that He wants to give to our lives. There are times where God doesn't want us to be scared of Him, like we run in fear and in fright. But the Bible talks a lot about the fear of God, where we stand in a reverence and an awe of an actual, real, holy God. And we need that to be restored back to our lives. And sometimes we experience Him in a powerful way, and we be still, and we know that He is God, and we ask for the fear of the Lord to come back to our hearts, where we live with an awareness, a living awareness of a mighty and a righteous and a holy God who sees everything that we do and knows everything that we are and that we stand in that and we be still and we know that he is God and we absorb into our heart and our spirit all that he is. You are great and you are mighty and you are holy and you are righteous and I stand before you in your presence and your son gave his life for me and I I don't know why you did it, but I receive it and I'm thankful for it. See, we need the fear of God restored back to our lives. Sometimes people are trying to get rid of their sin in their life. I'll tell you what, if you have the fear of God restored to your life, it's really not that hard anymore because you walk and you live with this reality, this awareness that God is with you. I sometimes describe the fear of God in this way, and it's a very bad illustration, but it's the best I can come up with, all right? So I kind of want to say I'm sorry, but I'd be saying I'm sorry for what I am, and I don't want to do that. When I preach or when I share or maybe when you're having a guest over at your house, this would be relatable to all of us, and you're sitting with a a friend, and and if you're married, and if you're not married, you can understand this, but if you're married, you're sitting there with your spouse and you're having a conversation with someone, and you're relating a story, maybe passionately, maybe a few of you, you're like, passionate, you're really getting into this story, and the story's getting a little bit better than it was, you know what I'm saying? And your spouse, it piques their interest, and they start to wonder, was I there? Because I'm not really sure if I was there. Because the story's better coming out of your mouth than it was if you were a participant. And the longer you go, the more they look over at you and go, I think you might be flubbing the story a little bit, you know? And, and if you have a very honest spouse who doesn't hold back, They'll say right there in front of your guests, that's not how it happened. <laughs> I've been in church before where some pastor's telling a story and their spouse can't help themselves. They're on like the front row. That's not how it happened. <laughs> I kind of duck and start to pray for their marriage. You know, I mean, I just don't know what to do. But sometimes I think about like when I'm up here and I'm sharing and, and my, my wife and my kids are here. My wife knows me better than anybody. She's She's not just my wife, she's my best friend. She knows everything. She knows every story. And I'll tell you, if I live in the awareness of truth because I walk 24 hours, I mean, to, I, I, I make a joke. I always say marriage is like surveillance, you know, 24 hours surveillance. <laughs> not, not in a burdensome way, but it's like you have accountability because you think you're spiritual and you think you're awesome and you think you're amazing. Then you get married and you realize you're not. You just were single, right? And so, and it's a blessing. I'm not trying to take that away. Don't don't misunderstand because my jokes aren't right. But my, my, 
But when I speak, I'm aware. My wife is aware because she was also there. To live in the fear of God is not to be scared of God, but it's to live in this reverential awe where he is always present and he is always there. And you think about your steps. You think about your thoughts. You think about what pleases him. You want to please God. And it's kind of like when I think about what I'm saying is like every now and again, I'll, I'll reference a date and then I look over at my wife. I'm like, is that about right? And she goes, close enough, you know. It's not a perfect illustration, but it helps me to understand what it's like to have a living awareness of somebody that is with you all the time. The disciples were afraid in this encounter, and I just am thinking about how we need to be restored back to the fear of the Lord, and sometimes experiences do that. We don't just want an experience so that we feel goosebumps, right? Like, I feel goosebumps. That's awesome. I want it to go beyond goosebumps, and I want to encounter the living God in a way where the fear of the Lord is... restored back to my life. And I live holy, not because I'm trying and I'm striving in my own strength, but because I'm aware of him and I'm asking of him and I'm receiving from him. See, when you're aware of God's presence more in your life, it's not that you're scared. You also know that what he asks you to do, he's the one that gives you the strength to do. So the more aware of him that we are, the more we're asking for him to help us as we live life as well. And the third part is the disciples had questions about their previously held beliefs. Look at chapter 9 and verse 10. As they were coming down from the mountain, he gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man rose from the dead. And, and they seized upon the statement discussing with one another, what does rising from the dead mean? And they asked him, now this is important, this is based on Malachi 4, chapter 4 and verse 5. They asked him about something theological that they had been taught for their whole life. And they said, why is it that the scribes say Elijah must come first? And he said to them, Elijah does come first, and he will restore all things. And yet, how is it written, the Son of Man, that he will suffer many things? He's kind of throwing something back at them to say, well, then I'm going to joggle your mind a little bit. But I say to you, Elijah has indeed come, and they did to him whatever they wished, just as it is written of him. He said, don't tell anybody about this until after I've risen from the dead. They obeyed that. But I want to tell you, you can obey Jesus and still have a lot of questions. They had questions. Sometimes because we have questions or even we have doubts at times, we don't know what to do with this, we think these questions disqualify us. I want to tell you, you do not need to have every question answered in order to follow Jesus in a serious way. Friend, in fact, I would tell you that you and I are on a pattern and a path of growth And God help us not be the person with all the answers in the room, but to be the person with more questions. And we're okay with those questions, asking of God, studying of his word, forever growing and learning more about God. I've got a lot of questions. When I was a lot younger than I am now, I had a lot more answers. How foolish I was. Because if you start with answers, you're not going to learn. Like my goal is not to be the smartest person in the room. My goal is to be the person that's the hungriest that's my goal. I want to be hungry. I want to learn. I want to grow. As we walk with Jesus and we, we grow, we never stop. You know. And I just want to encourage you today, if you have a lot of questions and you read this book and you're like, Ben, I don't understand a lot of it, join the club. Just don't use that as an excuse to not study this book. That's not okay. If we say, I don't understand it, Ben, Pastor Ben, I can never understand it. Friend, don't do that to yourself. I watch my kids. One of my kids, unnamed kids, one of them, It's not you. I only have one of them here today. I can talk about the rest of them. It's not gossip. It's just truth. (laughs) I get better in the next service, guys. All right. But uh, I think. (laughs) At least that's what's in my head. But um, I watch him, like, play this video game. I can't even play one sitting. He plays this game. He figures all this thing out, and they do these math things. I'm like, I, you know what it, you know what it is? They just took the time to learn how to do it. Some of you guys are good at stuff that, like, you don't want anybody else to know. You don't want nobody in the room to know you're really good at something. And you know how you got really good at it? It wasn't because you woke up. It was because you devoted time and attention to learning how to do something. And you gained a skill. Studying the Word of God, learning about God, it starts with humility, but we put some effort towards it. And if we don't do that, we can't use the excuse, well, I never understand it when I, when I read it. Friend, we can. You know, we can. My point is you can have questions, But there also is a place where God gives us answers as we learn and as we grow. But you're always going to have both. You're going to have questions. You're going to have answers. They had a question about Malachi 4, 5, the promise of Elijah returning. They were like, what about that, Jesus? We just saw Elijah. 
We just saw Elijah. And we have been told as uh, young Jewish boys growing up in our community that Elijah was going to return as the messenger to usher in the messianic age. Now we know you're the Messiah. We just saw Elijah. Can you help us understand why the scribes are teaching something that clearly is wrong? And Jesus essentially tells them, yes, they are wrong. Elijah did come. The spirit of Elijah was in John the Baptist. That's why he said they did to him whatever they wished. They killed him. Herod killed him is what happened to John the Baptist. And in a Jewish community, if you've ever done a Seder, you, you may not be, as a Messianic Seder, we don't always do this, but in Judaism and different kinds of Seders, they will set out a place for Elijah. They'll set out a, a, a place, and sometimes they'll set out a chair. And in some traditions, not only will they set a place for Elijah, but at the end of the Seder, they'll open the seat and they'll go open the door and they all sit down because they believe that Elijah's still going to come. And that's why they were confused is because they have practices and traditions that teach them about things that are yet to come when it already has happened. Here's my point. When you encounter God, when we experience God, listen to what happens. Sometimes the things that you think you know, now all of a sudden you have questions about. Why? Because he's incomprehensible. He's otherly. He's greater than. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. Look at church history. There were times where people thought they knew all this stuff, and then God encountered someone. And we had the Reformation age. God encountered people in Topeka, Kansas, and Azusa Street. And all of a sudden, we have the gifts of the Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit restored and released back upon the church. The Bible was always the same. What happened? God caused an experience to come about and his people woke up to the reality of what is in this book that Jesus is still doing what he's always done. And there are things that we right now are not alive to when it comes to the scriptures and God will encounter us at times. He'll illuminate the scriptures. The Holy Spirit will speak to us. He'll guide us into all truth and we wake up to what has always been true. Friends, don't you wanna wake up to what has always been true? No, the first thing we have to do is not sit there and act like we know everything. And if in our spiritual life what happens is we get more of a know-it-all, I'm telling you something is wrong. We were talking yesterday, a couple of our staff members and people were, uh, one of our unnamed staff members said, I'm becoming more of a Pharisee as I get older. And I, and I was like, I feel like I'm becoming less of a Pharisee as I get older, which means I already was one. And um, it doesn't mean I'm like, the dials move that much. I'm not shining my shoes here, but I'm just saying that I want to become more humble, don't you? And more pursuing of God to know Him and, and to encounter Him. A.W. Tozer said, when God is exalted to the right place in our lives, a thousand problems are solved all at once. When He's exalted to the right place in our lives. I bet you that happened for the disciples. I just have a quick minute to close here. Uh, the mountaintop takeaway for us. Um, again, I, I don't want to take away from the historical event and having a proper exegesis means you have your points come out of the passage. But just, just on a practical uh, note, I do believe that God wants us to experience Him. I do believe that. If He's a risen Christ and a living God, I believe that. It's not just theology when you say the Holy Spirit comes to live inside you. Friend, to me, it's just, I, I feel personally that it's foolish to think that if you're a believer in Christ and the Holy Spirit lives in you, that you're never going to actually experience Him. To me, He just lives too close to not believe that somehow, some way, you're going to experience Him. And the Bible says things like He guides you into all truth. What does that mean? Is it just your efforts? Is it just only when you study the Bible and that's when it happens, so it's always up to us? Or does God at times intersect with us in our life? And don't we need Him to do that? I've had a number of experiences. I don't tell people about them because then they think I'm the crazy Pentecostal, which I am. I mean, I love the Word of God, but I just love to encounter the Lord. And uh, this is truth, but... What also is true is that he comes to show us himself in ways that simply just confirm the Bible, but in our own lives. And one time I was praying, every house that I've lived in, I, don't, I can't even understand why this happens. Every house that we've lived in, my family and I, I've had a significant encounter with the Lord. 
I never asked him for it. It's just happened. So if you ask me why, I don't have an answer for you, but I know it's true. And in our first house, when we lived in Bothell, this is our first actual home, I was in the living room and I, I would stay up late and I do and pray. And I have some prayer time, usually like 30 minutes before I go to bed. And I just pray. I just want to pray before I go to sleep. And I give God my sleep. I want God to speak to me in dreams. And I ask him, Lord, take Take the night. I don't want to waste the night. One third of your life is in sleep. God can still use that. Did you know, amen? Did you know that? Yeah, in the Bible, there's 234 references to dreams and visions. So, I mean, so I give God my sleep and I, and I say, speak to me. And I had this incredible vision. Now, I have visions um, often when I pray for people. Not every time, but I have visions often. But this was not like that. This was like something opened up to me. And um, and again, if you don't know me, you know, maybe this isn't feel trustworthy, but I saw a mountain in this vision. It was like watching a movie. I saw a mountain, and in the mountain, I saw carved into it was a throne, and it was glorious. It was like gems all around it, and it was like colors I didn't understand, and it was like gold that, you know, I've never seen, and it, it, it just was glorious. And on the throne was God, but I couldn't see His face, and I couldn't make out His frame. I, I just couldn't. And from the throne emanated this kind of glory. And in those days, I didn't really have language for it. It was the glory. It was the light of God just emanating from the throne. And my eyes, I couldn't look at Him. And I fell to my knees because I was just so overwhelmed. It was like I was there, but I know I wasn't. And it was painful. The light, the glory of God was painful. It was like it hurt my body physically. And I looked to my right, because that's all I could really do, and I looked to my left, and there's tens of thousands of people on their knees crying out to God. And as the glory of God was just permeating, like this entire group of people crying out to a holy God, I heard the Scripture in my heart. I just heard it resounding like a voice. And it was Isaiah 6, 3, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. And something happened to me. I mean, I came out of that experience, and I just was marked. Um, I didn't want to share it with anybody because I didn't want to feel important. I didn't know why God showed me that other than to say I was marked. I felt like I trembled for like the next week or two. It was just an incredible thing, you know, and um, it changed me. And it's what really has propelled me to be a person in prayer. Like, I don't think that I'm this automatic intercessor. I want to tell you something. What has drawn me to the prayer room since I was 20 years old is this revelation of God's glory. And I know as we cry out to God, a real God, that He releases these things into the world that we cannot do. The powerful God, the mighty God. So when I go into the prayer room, friends, I'm looking for the mighty God, the holy God, the righteous God to answer the requests of his people. I'm not believing for less than that. I'm not just a happy, clappy Christian. I, I believe that God has a, an answer. He's the sovereign over all the earth, isn't he? He's the sovereign over all the earth. He said, pray that my kingdom to come and my will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's what's drawn me to the secret place in prayer, and it's what's drawn me into the prayer room. Maybe you need an encounter with the living God to draw you into places that will dust off your spiritual life. And if you could be honest, maybe these are the things that we avoid. We avoid places of prayer. We avoid gathering with God's people. I mean, we're here today, but we know that there's just something that sometimes we're avoiding the more in God. Well, I'll tell you what, if you encounter God, you don't want to avoid the more of God. You want to get into it instead of get out of it. It marks you. God wants to encounter us. He wants to encounters people in fresh ways. And that's, that's really what I want to pray for. And I don't know what that means. I, I, we don't dictate to God what it is, but we ask for Him to encounter us in a way where we experience His goodness, His truth, His life, and all that He wants to do so that we would be the people that bring Him glory in His own eyes. That's what we desire today. Would, would you stand? I, I, I want to close at this point. I want to say to you today that um, I don't know if you saw this in verse 8, but uh, I was reading it yesterday and it just struck, it struck me. It was totally out of context, I admit it. But it says, after the cloud and after the voice and all that they experienced, it says, and suddenly looking around, the disciples no longer saw anyone but Jesus only. I don't know why it just like stuck out to me, but Jesus only. If you go to Mount 
uh, Tabor is what you call it today, Mount, Mount Hermon. There's a shrine on the top of the mountain at some peak. There's a shrine there, one for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for Jesus. And I think they totally missed the point. They totally missed the point. Let's set up three tabernacles to de- like they're equal or something. But after that experience, it was just Jesus only. That was it, Jesus only. Just Jesus. I think we ought to have a sign up there that says, but Jesus only. That's what, <laughs> if we ever go to Mount Mount Hermon, that would be an amazing thing. Tim Keller wrote this, when Moses encountered God's glory, he reflected the glory of God as the moon reflects the sun. But Jesus produces the unsurpassable glory of God. It emanates from him. Jesus did not point to the glory of God as Elijah, Moses, and every other prophet had done. Jesus is the glory of God in human form. But Jesus only. Amen. What do we need today? Jesus only. Jesus only. Jesus only is everything. Let's pray that God would encounter us in whatever way he chooses. Would you join me? Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. We come to you. We ask you, Lord, that we would receive from you what you desire for us. Dust off our spiritual lives, Lord. Awaken us to your truth and your reality. I pray that we would experience you living God, risen Christ, in our midst here today. Lay your hands on us. We say with the song that we sing sometimes, come alive in the name of Jesus. Well, I bet the disciples came alive that day, a mountaintop experience for sure. I pray today, Lord, that we wouldn't need just something like that per se, but whatever you give, whatever you desire, Lord, we pray that we would come alive in the name of Jesus. To all that you are and all that you are doing, we ask you right now, come. Father, visit our lives. Bring revival as you do. Revive us, O oh God, we pray. Thank you, Lord. I had a prophetic picture as we were praying that somebody um, had recently had an x-ray. I know this is a little specific, but you had an x-ray recently and uh, is causing a little fear. The doctors don't know what is happening in your body. You just had an x-ray. You were at the doctors and you're waiting to hear back and it's just causing a little fear. We're praying healing over you today, whoever that might be. Um, You can come up after the service. I won't ask for a show of hands and Somebody else uh, in worship, I heard the Lord wants to hear your voice. He wants to give you your voice back. Somebody, you haven't been singing, you, not just in service, amen, I, but you haven't been singing. Something about this season has maybe brought a lament. You haven't been singing. The Lord wants to give your voice. Do you hear me? The Lord wants to give your voice back. He wants to hear you sing, and not, not just sometimes, but more often. God wants to give you your voice back. I hear him, worship, worship me. He wants to give that back to you. And then somebody else, I know this is a little sensitive, um, but you desire the Lord, but your heart is full of other things. Too many hobbies. That's the word that I had. You have too many hobbies in your life, and you need to lay some things down. You want more of God. You hear that in your heart. You hear it. But I hear the Lord saying to you that you, you need to lay down some hobbies. But as you do that and you heed the call of God, you're going to pick up the more that you truly desire. It's an exchange. You can't have it all. you got to lay some things down to have the more. And if you're willing to do that, I'm saying this to you. Watch what God will do. Amen. Father, thank you for your people. God, we gather around you and your word today. Holy Spirit, we pray you would breathe upon us whatever is true of what I just said. I pray let it stick in our hearts, Lord. We respond to you. We receive healing. Thank you, Lord. We receive repentance. If that's what we need today, uh, we also receive that word, worship, 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 Jesus only. We thank you in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, amen, amen. Amen.